Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at this time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Thing to eat. And he said to the Lord, Lord, the, the Spirit told him, take anything from this, this sheet, this blanket, kill it and eat it. And he said, Lord, these are unclean. I cannot eat these things. And later on in the story, we realize that the, that the Lord was calling him to go to the house of Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Basically, to break off all tradition, all Jewish law and go to the house of a man who is a God-seeker, but not a Jew. This is why it says early on that he got in big trouble. He didn't just, that's very light. He didn't just get in big trouble, but the, the, the teachers of the law really got angry at him. So it is evident that the Jews hated the Gentiles, but to say that they merely hated them would be a terrible understatement. They despised them. Hate is such a light word. Now, I'm going to backtrack to Acts 11, 2 to 3. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Mm -hmm. So they violently despised those who are non-Jews. And we can see an example of this seething hatred in Luke chapter 4. Jesus himself, Jesus our Lord, was preaching in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. When he was reading the scriptures and teaching with authority, everyone was amazed and impressed. So Luke 4.22 says, And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. But then his sermon takes an unexpected U-turn. And he continues on in verse 25 to 27 of the same chapter in Luke. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. So in other words, these two prophets did not go to any of their own kind to get provided for. Elisha didn't heal a Jew. Mm -hmm. He healed the captain of a pagan army. Mm -hmm. Because he had a slave girl who said, I know a man in Israel who prays to the God of heaven who can heal my master. Now, if you remember the story correctly, Elijah tells him to wash seven times in the Jordan River. Elisha, rather. 
And Naaman says, we have many rivers where I'm from. Why is he asking me to wash in this river? It's basically like somebody saying, it's that simple. God's instruction for my life to make it right is that simple. All I have to do is wash in this river. There's no, you know, waving of his hand, no laying of his hand. He's not going to take his staff and, you know, and point it at me. All this magic stuff. Now, if we're not familiar with the scriptures, we're going to miss what Jesus is saying. He mentions these two stories from the Old Testament. And uh, both of these people were Gentiles. And Jesus was making a point of saying that although there were many Jews around, God had ministered to them instead. So those listening to Jesus' sermon did miss the point. Because it continues, And all in the synagogue were filled with rage. See, hate is a light word. They were filled with rage as they heard these things. They rose up and cast him out of the city. The Jews, supposedly pious, supposedly holy, cast the God of the universe in human flesh out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Mm -hmm. See? Think about today, church. So many people tell me, I will believe in Christ if he's in my face. Mm -hmm. Look at the Jews. Sadly, they had a perception of who God was going to be. Political ruler, white horse, crown. So, because Jesus, in his physicality, was saying all of these things, they wanted to kill him. And we all know what happened. So this was not an isolated incident. In Acts 22, Paul was explaining his ministry to a massive crowd in the temple. And he gave his history and shared his testimony, and they listened patiently. But then he told them of God's commission to them. And it says in Acts 22, And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And they listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And we know about Paul's life, right? He didn't exactly have an easy life serving God. I mean, he was beheaded, right? So mm. he literally did exchange mm. his life. We talk about life exchange here in cross culture. And that is the ultimate life exchange right there. A God seeker who found the truth. So no hope and without God. The people in Ephesus had been Gentiles. Hated by the Jews, having no covenant with God, and not yet knowing Jesus Christ. So their situation was a mess. As Paul describes it, having no hope and without God in the world. Wow. All right? So let's begin to unpack with verse 13. So the Jews and Gentiles are separated by hate and bitterness on both sides. But in Christ, there is no more dividing wall. No more Jew or Gentile. Through the cross, both have been made one. See, that's the hard part right there. Even today, we don't focus on the essentials. We talked about, we heard about this this morning for those of us who were in the morning service. Instead of focusing on your view of salvation, let us focus on the fact that the God of the universe died on the cross and saved us. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Instead of focusing on, on a non-essential, like uh, style of worship, style of dress, whatever, let's focus on the fact that you're here. You're worshiping God and that you want to be God's seeker and you're seeking after him with all of your heart, mm -hmm. your soul, mind, and your strength. Right? So we are no longer Gentiles or Jews. We are kingdom children. Like Paul told the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, that's why the world today has a hard time accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because they look within the church and it's more messed up than outside. Think about it. There are people who could be, just like Wesley, people who could be churched their whole life but not be Christian. And that's why there are so many people who will say things like, oh, I don't need your God. I don't see you living the way that you should be living. You're telling me, you know, that there's an abundant life, that he is your foundation, that his, his, his steadfast love endures forever. And yet, 
how many times have we lost our temper? Mm -hmm. How many times do we have a short fuse? How many times are we so discouraged and at a low point that the people outside the church wonder, is church really doing anything for them? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We need to be on a level playing field. There shouldn't be any non-essential division in the kingdom of God. So here's a difficult question for everyone here. Hopefully, okay, is this true in your life? Can you honestly say about every Christian that you know? When I, when I was, when I was uh, reflecting on this, the portion that says hinders our prayers. No wonder there was a point in my own walk where God was delaying the answer. God will delay the answer if you do not clear away all of this within our spirit. Not only will our prayers be hindered, but we're going to wait a long time for the answer. See, at the cross, Jesus abolished this stuff. He made us one. He preached peace. You don't want to be on the same store as these people. You don't want to be in the same neighborhood as them, the same social circle as them even the same church as them. For those of you who know, I've been in many ministries that have divided because of this. And yet, it says here that in order to get to the Father, we need to be the same spirit as them. Ouch. Being the same spirit as a person who when I hear their name, I'd rather spit. Be in the same spirit as that neighbor who does not like me. Be in the same spirit as that person within my fellowship that gives me such annoying hard times. And yet it says here, we are in order to be one with the Father. We must be in the same spirit as them. And who is that spirit? The Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Right? There's a running joke that says, hopefully the Holy Spirit lives in you and not some other spirit. Let's move on. Fellow citizens. So every Christian in the world is a fellow citizen with every other Christian. Ouch. We all live in the same house, God's household, the kingdom household, the family of God. We all walk on the same foundation of the word of God, and Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. We need to be one in the one who dwells in us. And we need not be divided. Because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 25, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. What's that again? The foolish man built his house upon the sand. Don't make your foundation shaky, people. Because when the house of God is divided, it becomes powerless. So when our prayers aren't answered, when we feel like God is not there, when we feel weak, discouraged, as if anything that we ask for does not come, it is because we allow our faith to go unhinged. Every moment that we push God aside and we are not one with him in the spirit, that's when the delays come. That's when the answers are not answered. In 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11, it says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all agree and there be no divisions among you. But you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. So if we're not in unity, church, and we're not complete, then the world will not know God completely. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again. If we are not in unity and we are not complete, the world will not know who Jesus is completely. Because we are their perception of who Jesus Christ is. Mm -hmm. And if it's a little bit shaky, if your light is a little shaky, then they're not going to know the true Christ. Philippians 4, 2-3. I urge 
Sintuki. Oh yeah, I urge Judea and Sintuki to live in harmony in the Lord. Okay. Indeed, true com comrade, I ask you also to help this woman who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Mm. Do our names want to be in the book of life? Do we want to have that good and faithful servant stamp in our hearts? Mm -hmm. Then let's be in unity. Let's not dwell on the non-essentials. Yes. It's not about Episcopal, Nazarene, Catholic, Baptist. Uh, Baptist. It's all about the essentials. Are you a God seeker? Do, you, do we seek unity and do we seek after the Great Commission? That's all we need. Mm. Church, if we have difficulty with someone who is a Christian, reminds, who says that they're a Christian, let us remind ourselves that their name is in the book of life too. Now, depending on what that means, that's up to them. But make a point of being in unity and harmony with no division. As we end this evening, here are some words from Hebrews 12, and let it minister to our hearts this evening. Hebrews 12, 4 to 15. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and, may, and by it may be defiled. I will read that again. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Do we see the Lord? See it to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. Is there any dry spot, any uncertainty, anything that is causing trouble, and by it may be defiled? I was thinking about the message of Pastor Sonny this morning and how he was talking about the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our life. Remember, he emptied himself so that he could understand who we are. There's a saying he could have called 10,000 angels to free himself, but he didn't. So let's not take that for granted. Father, right now, I'd like to take this time once again to, to pray and to remind ourselves of verse 10 where, verse 10 of this chapter which says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Heavenly Father, may we pursue peace and unity in the body of Christ. Lord, in this world, even in the church, there is this in the club, out of the club mentality, Lord. Sadly, Father, although that is true, I praise God for all of the churches and fellowships that we are a part of, that we consider intimacy with you and the pursuit of peace and unity, an opportunity to show the world the full face of Jesus, God. Lord, I ask right now that if there's anything that is distracting us from that, may we hand it over to you this, this evening. Father, I go back to the analogy of that mirror once again. A true mirror shows our strengths, shows our weaknesses, but also shows who you are reflected as far as spirituality reflected in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we serve a God that is very much alive. Again, Lord, thousands and millions of people go to the Kremlin in Russia to see the body of a dictator. And yet, as our general superintendent said last week, the moment she steps outside, she realizes that Christ, God, is very much alive. He lives. 
He lives within us today. Amen. That old hymn, we serve a risen Savior who's in our lives today. He lives within our heart. Yes. So Father God, right now, let us reflect on your faithfulness, mm. your goodness, Lord, and also the fact that we are here to worship you. Again, like last week, in your mind, you can write it down even, but you don't have to. Think again of somebody. It could be somebody who's been churched all their lives. But like West, John Wesley has not yet become a Christian. Whoever that is, there is hope. Pray for them right now. Got somebody in your family who's lost. You have people who, especially you parents who have children who you trained up in the way they should go. Pray that they won't depart from it. Yes. They will come back. For those of us who have relatives who we think, oh, they'll never come to Christ. Never say never. Look at Rabbi Zechariah. Atheist on the brink of suicide. Mm. Never say never. C.S. Lewis. So many people of the faith. Yes. They had people around them who said they will never come to Christ. Oh, how wrong they were. So focus on those people for now. And then through the week, that they may see the face of Christ in your life. We're not perfect? Yes, I know. You'll probably tell me, Pastor, I'm just a person. I have flaws too. But may those flaws also be shed and the light of Christ be shed. Thank you again, Lord, for today. And thank you for your word that there is unity in the body of Christ. Yes. And may we dwell on the essentials of the faith. Accepting you as Lord and Savior, being baptized, and being in fellowship with fellow believers. Let us reconnect with you if we're disconnected. And once again, Lord, let us find those job openings that we have in the kingdom that we have not yet filled. Thank you again, Lord, because you are worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.